Welcome to First But Last, brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. I am your host, Emmy DeGrappa. Wyoming is called the Equality State because we were the first to give women the right to vote. 150 years later, we wonder what Wyoming women think about their progress toward equality now. Let's find out, and thank you for listening. Today, we are talking to Sarah Flitner. Sarah has more than 20 years of experience in collaborative, problem-solving, and organizational leadership. She was born and raised in Shell, Wyoming, and she went and graduated to the University of Wyoming. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. It's great to be here. Absolutely. What, what is it to be an organizational leader? How do you do that? My parents have been asking me that question for 30 years. What does she do for a living? Uh, Really what that means is I work with teams and leaders to identify patterns of behavior that can be improved to optimize performance and frankly, enjoyment, because we show up uh, for work and spend a lot of our hours, a lot of the hours of our lives at work and making that productive and a positive experience is something I've always been really interested in. So how do you bring people together? What is your client? What do they come to you with? What are the problems they come to you with? That's a really good question. It's usually some complicated negotiation. It's a misunderstanding. It's a need to be perceived differently or feel like they should be perceived differently with their constituency groups or the public. Uh, But I would honestly say um, if people remembered good manners and really active listening, you know, I might be much less busy on a weekly, daily basis. So it's those things that we know to do as humans that are simple, but very, very difficult. And of course, the evidence now, the the neuroscience is teaching us that um, just knowing something is not the same as being able to do it. So I can know that a marathon is 26 miles. That doesn't mean I can necessarily run it. I can know what empathy means and what showing up with as an active listener should be, but unless I actually practice building those neural networks, they're not going to be in place for me to be able to do that. So, wow. That's, yeah. that's very interesting. What was it like growing up in Shell, Wyoming? I have to say it felt pretty ideal. And as I look back, you know, there are so many active metaphors in the landscape, which I think is almost every Wyomingite's experience. But I, you know, I often tell the story that my earliest childhood memory is being, you know, four or five years old, feeling like I was alone in this giant, like 10,000 acre pasture. We were moving cattle and we were, you know, scattering to gather them. So everyone had acres to cover and feeling, you know, both invigorated and kind of like they must really trust me and also scared to death that I would never see anybody I knew again because it's it's a big, you know, Wyoming's a big landscape and we're small in it. Of course, you know, the metaphor for me is that what I learned later is my parents could see me the whole time. I wasn't alone. It taught me a little bit about l- leaning into that self-reliance but also really trusting the interdependence that is our state. And who were your mentors growing up? Certainly all of my family. You know, I'm one of four siblings. Um, I'm the middle. And my parents, they had a great work ethic, uh, incredible group of friends who were reliable, generous neighbors. You know, that, that interdependence was alive in the landscape for sure. I really look up to ordinary people who show up in ordinary ways but don't stop. You know, there was an old couple, John and Mary Ashton, that stayed up in the high country all the time, and she did her piece of making a home in their little trailer, and he literally rode herd on the uh, for the summer cattle, and just watching them show care for each other, for for us as we came and went, kept the cattle and horses safe and the livestock cared for, just watching the the way ordinary people are extraordinary. Do you think growing up in Wyoming is a lot different than growing up anywhere else? Or do you think it's that unique, that that you have a different perspective and view of the world when you grow up on a ranch? 
Well, <laughs> the word that came to mind when I went off to college in Arizona as a freshman was not unique, but weird. Um, I do think it's unique. I, I didn't realize that, you know, when you're swimming in the water, it's just, uh, you know, you're used to the temperature. It is a unique experience. Uh, very few of us uh, have the opportunity to grow up in agriculture. And I think that that, you know, there are lessons that you just, you learn so quickly. Um, as I am a parent of teenage boys now, you know, looking for opportunities for them to to fail at some things and learn from their mistakes. That was a daily occurrence on a ranch. You know, you left the gate open, something got out, and there was hell to pay, if not worse. So um, I really think those kinds of lessons are just hardwired in my problem solving and my ability to connect or desire to connect with other people. Yeah, I would say it's unique to, how's that for a circuitous answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that it is unique in, in that you, we do have these big wide open landscapes and there is a nature deficit for a child who grows up in the city and doesn't have those real life experiences on a ranch living among animals. And don't you think? I do. That's so well put. I don't think a single Wyomingite I know takes that for granted, the ability to be out outdoors in the landscape and just what that does in terms of rest and replenishing and, you know, helping our creative energies soar as yours do. Um, for me, it's just a, it is part of my daily sanity routine to be outside. And, you know, I, I do a lot of driving around the state and region, too, because um, there are challenges being a small populous state with 97,000 square miles and getting around those miles is one of them. But I find it really relaxing if the if the weather is good to drive across our state to me. That windshield time that that is open, wide open real estate for just thinking thoughts, you know, just what are the, the ideas? Where is the innovation? What is possible? What is important to me? And listening to podcasts. And for sure, listening to <laughs> your podcast. <laughs> we are celebrating Wyoming as the first state to give women the right to vote. And... We are affectionately known as the cowboy state, but actually, officially, we are called the equality state. Mm -hmm. What do you think is your experience as a woman growing up in Wyoming? And what have been your challenges along the way in your career? Or ha have there been? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, let's see. There are the mundane challenges like... There's no cell service. I'm going to leave for Cody at five in the morning and I'm going to have an hour of cell service along the way. Um, so there are funny sort of um, d challenges that are related to it really is difficult to do business in a state with such a small population. And we're just we don't have the easy access to other markets, talent, people. Uh, but as a woman, that's a very different question. And and I'm really proud of being a Wyomingite and our aspiration to equality. But I got to say, you know, and I've got a big planning committee that agrees with me and it's men, it's women, it's um, heterosexual, gay, Latina, African-American, a diverse, diverse planning committee planning this symposium to really have a discussion about equality in our state because in all honesty, the last time we did something of note for equality in this state was about 150 years ago. And I am committed to changing that with a lot of other incredibly bright, committed, caring people. Um, you don't talk to anybody who doesn't want it. Maybe they're being polite to me because, uh, you know, persistent is my middle name. But I don't hear anybody say that they think we're, we're doing all right and that we're where we want to rest I hear people say, we can do so much more and so much better, and our state deserves it, and our young people deserve it. So, you know, that's that's sort of where I'm coming from. I, I, I guess the only other thing I will say is that I do, in my world, because I have a consulting business and a practice that is driven by me, I have been really lucky and empowered in my career by accident, 
not necessarily by design. Doesn't mean that I haven't had my experiences that were challenging with men. But when I was in office as mayor, that was my best um, exposure to sort of systematic structural bias or oppression. And I, it's, it's there. You know, we, we pay women differently. We treat women differently. We expect them to keep calendars and keep track of details. And, you know, I, I had a great relationship with my team, but there was one in particular, we had a good laugh because he kept losing, you know, meeting details and texting me to ask where was the meeting and where were we going to, you know, how, where was the address? What was so-and-so's phone number? And I finally said, you don't get it. You know, I'm a working mom. Every time my phone buzzes, it should be something that only I can do. And I'll bet that you wouldn't have asked my predecessor, you know, to provide that information. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot to learn. I had to learn about how to have that conversation with humor and care because both of those were authentic feelings I had and say, truly, I need more from this because uh, it's just I, I don't want to answer questions that aren't in my lane that somebody else can answer. Right, right. You have two boys, right? I do. And how are you raising your boys in the hashtag Me Too era? They have an extremely um, quality father. They have examples in my father and all of their uncles and their other grandfather in terms of men who, who just it's in their bones to be respectful. And I don't know why I got so lucky because it's just luck. So I, I give a lot of credit to my husband and the, the men who are I'm related to who have just always done better than lots of other men. I also think my husband and I have made an effort to really show that there's no perfection, but there is a fair approach, which usually means you, you've got to listen to what your partner wants and what they're aspiring to achieve and then you've got to make sure that the playing field is fair, you know, that one person isn't always um, going to the dentist or fixing dinner or worrying about one set of problems unless that's explicitly agreed to. So it's it's back to that simple good manners and communication. If you really have respect for another human, you know, listening and supporting what helps them develop and grow is a part of that partnership. And what about young women? How how do you think we can be mentoring young women to recognize their potential or, you know, make advances for themselves in, you know, places that are not equal, like in equal pay mm -hmm. or in how people treat or how they're treated? Mm -hmm. I wish that I had asked more questions and asked for more help from people who I knew were smarter and knew more than me. So I would say to young women, ask for help. Ask, if you don't know the answer, ask someone because you have an army of people like myself and like you, Emmy, who want to help. And if I had known that that was okay, that I could say, help me demystify this, or, you know, I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have used that big word in it when I was 22, but I would have said, I don't get it. You know, I, I, I am scared to take this leap or, you know, I really want to take this job, but I don't think I can pay my rent on what they're offering. You know, what? Um, one of the things I love doing the most with women is tell every single conversation I have with a young professional woman, no matter what you are offered in terms of a new job or pay raise, counter. I don't care if you ask for five more dollars. I don't care if you ask for 20 more percent. Never say okay on the first round. There's just... There's no reason to leave that on the table. And most, uh, I haven't heard of, not one woman has come back to me and said she didn't get more. And, you know, we can, we can take a page from our, our peers, men who lead with that kind of courage, and they, they almost always ask, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, those are a couple of things. I would, you know, uh, use your voice and use it to ask questions. You know, it's not about knowing the answer. It's about looking around at all the people with whom you are interdependent, who want to see you thrive and succeed and make your communities better. Mm -hmm. Have you always been a working mom? I have. Do you think that's 
made a difference for you in terms of just having your eyes opened to um, inequality issues for women versus a woman who stays at home and raises her kids and doesn't have that outside kind of interaction going on? That's a great question, Emmy. I have to, again, I give my credit, my husband so much credit. I, I knew that I wanted to work. That's I just have a desire to um, ensure that I am secure. And I, it's just, you know, in my DNA. I think it's so much harder for my friends who have stayed at home and done the job of managing all the complexities of the household on their own. Um, it's, it, it's very easy to lose your voice or have your voice diminished in those scenarios. And, and my friends who have that scenario, you know, the ones that I really admire, just they're strong. And they know their value and they take that very seriously and set a great example for, you know, sometimes the best uh, case scenario for a marriage is divide and conquer. You know, my husband and I do laugh sometimes because it's like, did you go to the dentist? And I do, is it my appointment? Was it your appointment? Was it, you know, we're kind of sharing all kinds of um, responsibilities, household, income, sports, and it can get chaotic and confusing. But it did, you know, I I liked being engaged in conversations that mattered to on a community and state level, like equality. And I just wanted to make sure that I could maintain a seat at that table. Well, I really think that you chose the right um, career path, that you have a, a, a really strong voice and it's great that you're willing to mentor young women and and help them figure out that they can do that, that they can stand up for themselves, and it's okay. They can. I should tell them, too, uh, a more advice career. Wh- wear your son's green. Start wearing it right now. <laughs> Especially in Wyoming. Right. Well, thank you for being here, Sarah. My pleasure. Good luck to you. This is going to be a great success. Thank you. Thank you for listening to First But Last, brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. Please join us again next week as we continue our conversations with women from around the state. You can also find us at thinkwhy.org, where we continue the conversation on our blog about the history, journey, and the challenges of Wyoming's intrepid women living in the equality state. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you for listening.